and welcome to AMC Mailbag, the show dedicated to mailbag and answering your movie-based questions. If you've got a burning question, make sure you send it in anytime, anyplace at amcmovietalk at gmail.com. It could be answered right here on Mailbag or Monday through Friday on AMC Movie Talk. Hey there, I'm your host, Maud Garrett, and joining me to answer all of your questions is the editor-in-chief of AMC, Mr. John Campia. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to Mailbag. Very excited about this. I'm so glad it's the weekend already. Mm. This is a big week coming up. Star Wars Celebration. We got the IAWTV Awards in Vegas we're going to. A lot of very cool things coming this week. We are going to have a lot of fun, that's for sure. Yes, yes, we are. Let's get stuck into it straight away. The first question is from Jonathan Hazelwood, who writes, Love the show. Loving Phase 3. Keep up the great work. You guys have talked about the infancy of DC's cinematic universe. Do you think it's too early for something like Suicide Squad? squad, especially since we haven't even seen some of the heroes that put these guys in prison. For instance, shouldn't we be seeing this new Joker in a Batman movie? Well, I mean, look, when you're asking a question about is it too soon, is it too soon, you're assuming you know what the story is. And therefore, if the story is going to be what I'm assuming it is, then it's too soon to do this. The reality is we don't know what it is they're setting up or how they're constructing it. We don't even really know how they're doing the Suicide Squad. I mean, it's it's tied into the same universe, but it's probably have very little to do. I'll be surprised if Ben Affleck doesn't at least show up for a short cameo in Suicide Squad. I have a feeling he will, but that's just a guess. But even that being said, at this point, it's impossible to say until we see Batman versus Superman and then see Suicide Squad, was this too early for something like this? Now, look, if you look at something like the Marvel paradigm, they waited till they were, what, eight films in for them to go to their kind of reaching for it. Not, the general population don't know these characters with their Guardians of the Galaxy, and then they did it. That's fine, but just because they did it that way doesn't mean that's the way DC has to do it. For all we know, with the universe they're setting up and the story that they're setting up and what their plans are for each of these individual characters, now is the perfect time for a Suicide Squad. So when you're saying is it too early, it's an impossible thing to say when we don't know what their goal is right now. Let's get an idea about what their goal is, what their direction is, where they're heading with this thing, and then we can start formulating an idea about whether this is the perfect time for Suicide Squad or maybe they push it to be a little bit early. Do you see that DC is using this as a spin-off or do you think that this will fall into the storyline with Superman, uh, Batman vs. Superman? I think it will be both. Mm -hmm. now, and here's the fascinating thing. One of the things I said when, like this is going back a year or two years ago, when DC was going to start setting up their cinematic universe, I always thought they should do it completely the opposite way that Marvel did it. Marvel did it single film, single film, single film, single film Avengers, right? And everybody said, when, when it became clear that DC wasn't going to do that, some people started complaining. He's like, no, 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 no. Yeah, that worked for Marvel. And that's great. It's wonderful that it worked for Marvel. But that doesn't mean it's the only way it can work. I've always felt that for Justice League, or yeah, for, essentially for Justice League in the DC Cinematic Universe, I thought the best way to do it is you have two monster heavy hitters in Batman and Superman. Start with your Avengers kind of movie and introduce your lesser known characters alongside of your giant ones and then spin off their individual films. I always thought that was the best move for DC. But let's carry that logic through. Let's look at some of their villains. Maybe, maybe... A Suicide Squad movie is just simply the best way to introduce us to Deadshot, to introduce us to the Joker, to introduce us to Harley Quinn, to introduce us you know, to all these different characters we have. Bring them in all in one big movie that will then power and fuel individual movies or if not their own individual movie like a spin-off Deadshot movie or a spin-off whatever. At least when, you know, if Deadshot shows up in another uh, DC hero movie, he's already been built up in Suicide Squad. That one movie is going to build up four, five, six different characters in one shot. So I really do think this is a very creative and the best way for a DC cinematic universe to go. So it's not burning the candle at both ends, it's just simply lighting an inferno. Yes, yes, pretty much that's it. <laughs> and uh, I've just realized your name is John, therefore you are Mr. J. That's, yeah, actually, yes, that's me. Thanks, Puddin. <laughs> Alrighty. Brittany Bailey writes in, Hey, AMC gang, writing from North Carolina here. I love the show. My question is, do you think Mad Max will bomb at the box office? The trailers look amazing, yet I have seen little to no promotion for it. I really don't think that anyone who doesn't actively follow movie news even knows about this movie, uh, even knows this movie exists. I I just can't shake the feeling that this movie could potentially bomb, which is a shame because I think this movie could be epic. Thanks and keep up the great work. 
Well, I mean, there's a little bit of contradiction in your email there. You love the trailers, but you've seen no promotion. But you've seen the trailers. I think a lot of people have seen the trailers. They have been playing, especially the first trailer they put out. I saw that play in front of a lot of films, as a matter of fact. I remember, we're still one month out. Their heavy print stuff is going to start. I think we saw Mad Max on the cover of, if I'm not mistaken, I think we saw them on the cover of uh, EW. Uh, anyway, I've seen them on the cover of several magazines. And now that we're getting into that one-month window pretty soon, they're going to amp up the traditional support, not just online, not just in theater, theatrical uh, trailers. They're going to start amping up television prints. They're going to start ramping up uh, magazines and newspaper ads. This is all going to be hitting. Mad Max is a recognizable, bankable franchise name that people know. The trailers have been pretty fantastic. Now, me personally, I wasn't a big fan of the first one, but I am head over heels about the second one. And I think a lot more people than you're giving it credit for have seen these trailers. It is a summer film through and through when you look at it. It's got that big, bombastic kind of feel to it. I think people are attracted to it. Now, then it will all depend on how you define bomb. This movie will not, in all true definition of the terms, bomb. This movie's going to make money. Now, does that mean this movie's going to be a $500 million movie? Not necessarily. But it doesn't have to be a $500 million movie to be a big hit. And it might be a $500 million movie. But, you know, I see this movie making $300 million worldwide plus. I think it's going to be just fine. I think they're, the studio's already thinking brand new franchise for this. They've signed their actors on for multiple deals. Once again, that doesn't mean they're going to make multiple movies. But they want to be able to. So they want to see the success of the first one. I Honestly... I think there's a 5% chance that this movie bombs. I really don't see it happening. Do you think this movie's going to fail? No. I think people have been wanting this. And I think there has been hype for a couple of years now. As soon as we realized there was another one coming, uh, I'd seen uh, first looks of the game uh, two years ago at E3. Mm. So I know that they have been building into this franchise. And I think uh, there's already been a screening uh, recently. Didn't um, D Dr. Miller put on a screening for it and show like uh, 20 minutes of it? I'm not familiar with that. I, I know Schnepp saw it like five months ago. But. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I want to hear from you though. A prediction, a ballpark opening weekend. What do you think it's going to pull? Opening weekend, Mad Max Fury Road. I'm going to go $72 million opening weekend. Okay. You heard it here first. And uh, <laughs> one little uh, side question here. Do you think it is a coincidence that Tom Hardy is in this movie and his cousin, Mr. Evil Bane, in this picture just happens to be in Mad Max? Look at that picture. Oh, my Tell goodness. Tell me that's not Bane's evil cousin. I never even put two and two together, but you're right. You know what? Tom Hardy's playing both roles. I'm going to call it right now. No, he's not. <laughs> he's not. He's so used to it. You are so good as Bane. We just want you back. Bigger in the desert. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I got to of myself trying to pretend <laughs> to be a, um, an executive in Hollywood. Josh Sutton writes, Hey AMC crew, I watch you guys every day and I want to congratulate you guys on phase three. My question is about Liam Neeson. Do you think he will ever return doing dramatic roles like he did in Schindler's List? I thought he was terrific in that role and I feel like with the right director, he could win an Oscar. Oh yeah, like, there's no denying Liam Neeson is an Oscar caliber type of actor. Uh, we've seen, we saw him do a lot of dramatic stuff before. That's what That was his bread and butter. And then came Taken. Mm. Um, and, you know, Liam Neeson has said himself, why is he making all these action movies? Well, because I only got a few more years left that I can do these types of action movies and be believable in them. Right now, Liam Neeson can do an action movie and scare the crap out of me. You know, because he's just big, menacing, that voice, mm. whatever, all that kind of stuff. But you can't be that menacing figure forever. And he said so. He goes, I've only got a couple more years left. He's going to have a lot of time to do to go back to those dramatic roots, to do all those other types of films that he wants to do. But the problem is, once he hits a certain age, according to him, that once he hits a certain age, the big action roles won't become, become an option anymore. Why not do them while, I, while I'm able to do them right now? All the dramas will still be there, be there later, and it won't matter what his age is at that point. And he'll be totally fine. So will he get back into drama? Absolutely. But I, for one, am somebody who supports his decision to, even if some of them are kind of cheap and frilly, do these action films. If he likes doing them and he has fun, he's only got a certain number, a limited window to do them. Do them. Have fun. Enjoy yourself. Bank the money. Do all that kind of stuff. And then when you're ready, go back to the dramas and he'll, he'll get an Oscar on his shelf. Is Liam Neeson doing these action roles because he wants to? Or is he doing them because Taken was so good and he was so great as that hero that that's all he's getting offered now? I know. I, I, I wouldn't believe for a second that these action films are all, all he's getting offered. Okay. I don't believe that for a minute. I think he has such a track record of success in everything that he's in. So I think people, everybody who's got it, every studio who's got a script for an action film right now, yeah, they want Liam Neeson. He's like the Bruce Willis of the moment. It is. Mm. And that's why, and you know what, being that hot in one genre... 
It's a limited time that he's going to have that at, at his age already. It's not like he, you know, did take it at the at age 30, right? Mm. So now's the time to do it. And once he's done, I think you're going to see him do these other films. And he's going to have so much money in the bank. He won't worry whether it's a $10 million paycheck. He can do the great dramatic pieces for a million bucks and whatever. You're going to see him do a lot of them. And I think he's going to get offered offered an awful lot of them too. I miss him as Aslan. And Qui Gon <laughs> He has Jin. a great voice. Great voice. Yeah. Oh, that accent. But I also loved him in Love Actually as the, the no, comical great dad. In Love Actually. And then it's like, if maybe if he has his son, he's the nice dad. If he has a daughter, <laughs> he will find you and he will kill you. <laughs> Very dramatic. Cool. Pause. Thank you. Moving on. <laughs> maybe, maybe they'll get me on one day. No, kidding. All righty. John David Davidian writes Jim Carrey was one of the perennial Hollywood funny men, but. He's fallen off the map. Besides the recent Dumb and Dumber, which had mixed reviews, why isn't Jim Carrey making more films? You know, I'll go on record right now. I think me and John Schnepp, much like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the two of us, I think we're the only guys who really like Dumb and Dumber. You did not. I did. Oh, the I first did. one or this Dumb and Dumber 2? This Dumb and Dumber 2, I really liked it, as a matter of fact. I thought it had a lot of the greatness of the original. I really did. There were a lot of... La now, is it as good as the original? No. No, 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 no. no. But... There were at least a dozen times that I was laughing out loud. At least a dozen times that I was laughing purely out loud. I had a good time with it. Um, and it's funny, too, because I went with a small group of people. And we all really enjoyed it. And we had read the reviews first. It's like, oh, apparently this is sucks. So, well, we'll go see it anyway. And we had a good time. We had a really good time. Now, that being said, why isn't Jim Carrey doing more movies? Well, it's not by choice. Uh, it's not like a lot of people think if somebody's a movie star, that just means they're in whatever movie they want to be in whenever they want to be in it. And that's actually a very small percentage of performers in Hollywood that can actually function on that kind of a level. Jim Carrey isn't in more movies because Jim Carrey isn't getting offered more movies mm. or he's not winning those auditions. I mean, there's, there was a time when Jim Carrey didn't have to audition for a movie. Now he does. He has to audition for a role. And he has, and, you know, and that's probably not a lot of fun when you were used to being like one of the kings of Hollywood. Now he's not. People aren't tripping over themselves to go to Jim Carrey movies anymore. I am also one of the few guys who I like the incredible Burt Wonderstone. I had fun with that movie too. And I thought him as the Chris Angel mm. kind of knockoff, I thought he was actually pretty funny in that. Um, and I, I liked him in Dumb and Dumber. I liked him in Kick-Ass too. Although he wasn't in that movie nearly long enough. Then there was that whole fiasco about not willing yeah. to promote the film and whatever. Let's put that. That's not going to gratiate you to Hollywood Studios, by the way, Jim. If you want to get more roles, you know, pull in little dramas and saying, I'm not going to promote that movie I was in. It's going to make a lot of people back off wanting to work from you, for you too. So why doesn't he do more? Because he doesn't have the option to do more. Mm -hmm. Could he turn it around? You're damn right he could turn it around. He's still a comedic genius. Whether he's hit it out of the park the last couple of times he's tried is almost irrelevant. He has the potential to be it because because we've seen him do it a number of times. We've also seen he's got some dramatic chops, but he seems to keep falling out of that no matter yeah. what. So, hey, look, where is he right now? He's not in a great place right now. Also, although in a much better place than 90% of the actors in this town, obviously. But could he return to that greatness? I'd say there's a solid, and I mean this whole lot, I think there's a solid 20% chance that... Uh, a guy like Jim Carrey can return to that greatness. He's got to start doing some things differently, though. He's got to be very selective about what he does from now on. In the next two or three pictures and, and projects that he's able to land and gets to pick from, make sure they're good ones and really, really crush them. And I think you could see a Jim Carrey resurgence. Hmm. Well, I, I think you kind of nailed it with uh, Jim Carrey being a comedic actor. That's where mm. his strength lies. Yeah. And when I watched Dumb and Dumber 2, I saw, yes, Jim nails this role of just being over the top. <laughs> but the problem was that Jeff Daniels just really, really reminded me he's not a comedic actor. And I that, think he is. No, that was forced for him when he was saying his Loved lines. Him. I was like, oh, this is so jarring to watch because it's just, I don't think he was able to translate it into a comedic role. But that being said, the last ones that we've seen, Burt Wonderstone, Dumb and Dumber 2, he's doing a, twer a tweak on the same role, that comedic, mm. that comedic vibe. What's happening with him personally, what I've noticed when I've been interviewing him, is that he's going very spiritual. He's getting yeah. serious inside. So if his real strength is the comedic roles and he's kind of wanting to mature and be spiritual internally, that could be a block. A, you know what's the, funny though? I was at... I, I did the press junket for the incredible Burt Wonderstone in Vegas. Mm -hmm. I was and, there. Yeah. Were you there for that? Yeah. Well, were you there for the press conference that they did? No. Well, they did the press conference part and 
It is one of the best press conferences I've ever been to because Jim Carrey was just had everybody, the, the press, the other people, just in stitches. Yeah. He was so funny. It was it was almost like he thought he was at the improv and doing old, his old stand-up mm -hmm. again. He was really, really great and really, really funny. And I just want to see him... I'd love to see him return to greatness. He's just not there right now. The uh, interview that I did with him for that particular interview, uh, I challenged him to a face-off and <laughs> I won. <laughs> that, it's all the power of the mouth. He couldn't get that one up. That's all right. Um, Nikolai Quack says, I'm a huge James Bond fan and really excited for Spectre being released this year. So with Daniel Craig's Bond, I feel like a lot of people have accepted and in fact even embraced the darker, more serious Bond movies. However, at the same time, I see people saying that Craig is their favourite Bond, while no one ever really talks about Timothy Dalton's take on the role, even though he was the one who started to do more violent and realistic Bond pictures. I personally think that he paved the way for Craig and think he definitely deserves more recognition, especially for License to Kill. What do you think? Um, first of all, I love Timothy Dalton. I think he's terrific. I only think see him in Hot Fuzz. <laughs> well, I mean, whether he's popping up in Hot Fuzz and those damn Druid robes and whatever, or whether you're seeing him in Chuck, um, or whether you're seeing him, you know, he's just done a lot of different things and he's always really cool to see. Living Daylights, License to Kill, uh, we're all great, they're both great films. But I'll say this, um, I don't believe that, uh, you know, that Daniel Craig was the guy to institute a violent bond or a serious bond. That was Sean Connery, man. I mean, Sean Connery was that. I've always said this, and this is what makes Daniel Craig so special, that when you look at all the bonds, they fall into one of two baskets, whether it's Lazenby or Pierce Brosnan or Timothy Dalton or whatever, they tend to fall into one of two categories, the uh, Roger Moore style bond or the Sean Connery style Bond. You know, you get a guy, I, I thought Timothy Dalton was very much in the vein of a Sean Connery style Bond. I thought Pierce Brosnan was very much in the Roger Moore vein of a Bond. But what I think made, Dan what, what makes Daniel so special is that he's the first Bond I saw that is truly amalgamation of both of those guys. He has the pure suaveness of a Roger Moore Bond. He's got the badassness of the Sean Connery Bond. And he and and yet and also brings something very unique to it as well. On top of that. And that in that way, he brings us a Bond that we've never seen before, and yet completely feels like Bond at the same time. Very unique, very difficult to pull off, um, and I still can't believe there's some morons out there who had this website called craignotbond.com when they, that guy's got blonde hair! Really? That's the important thing about what goes into James Bond? Anyway. Uh, so that's what I think makes him a great James Bond, but that takes nothing away from the contribution that Timothy Dal Dalton gave us. I kind of wish he had done one more uh, at least it's unfortunate he only gave us two because I thought he was really solid in both. But uh, hey, we still got those two that he did. And, and thinking that Daniel was the best of them all, which is my personal opinion, a lot of people disagree, which is cool, takes nothing away from how good Timothy Dalton was. Be honest, have you fantasized at all, even a little bit, about who the next Bond could be? I have allowed myself to fall into that trap, even mm -hmm. though we're years away, because I think he's still got this, he's still got another film he's going to do, so we're at least four years away, maybe five from another one. Look, obviously we've been caught up in a lot of the discussion about the Idris Elba possibility. Mm. That's been brought up a lot. Um, but that's pretty much as far as I've really seriously gotten, because it's hard to think about who right now would make a great Bond. Well, who knows what the landscape's going to look like in four years? And that's really the timeline we're looking at when we're going to start talking about a new James Bond. Who knows who's going to be the hot thing at the time? I mean, I'll be honest with you. As of right now, I really do like, this came up on AMC Movie Talk the other day. I like Henry Cavill. Mm -hmm. I really do. A lot of people forget that Henry Cavill was the runner-up to Daniel Craig to play James Bond. And he just lost. And actually, Henry Cavill was the director's choice. He was his pick. Producers overruled it. They wanted somebody a little bit older at the time. And then with Daniel Craig, we ended up with our best James Bond ever. But now that we see Henry, who has evolved into a terrific actor in his own right, in four more years, he's going to be getting close. He's, he's going to be mid-30s, getting closer to 40, stuff like that. I think he'll be the right age. I think he'll be even more seasoned as an actor. He's definitely got the physical prowess to do it all. As of right now, if I had to say right now, I would pick Henry Cavill or Idris Elba. But who knows what we're going to say in four years. Who do you fantasize as the new James Bond? I think the next James Bond should be take a step out of the traditional white male. I think that it could be any other race. I think it could be another sex. Maybe you could have a chick bond. And if no one believes that that could happen, we've seen Alias. There's a, a video game, Perfect Dark, with Joanna Dark. Like the, the female protagonist is a lot of fun as well. And it could happen. 
Never say never. Actually, never say die. What? Never say die. What? Bring it back. Mario Lopez. Whoa. Hi, Slater. The, the Mario <laughs> Lopez. God, this is awesome. F you, Slater. <laughs> Yeah, let's throw a TV at him. <laughs> Hi, crew of AMC, awesome channel, and even better people. My question is uh, about the advanced screening that you all get. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you all get to see on Thursday. <laughs> oh, my question is about the advanced screening you all get to see on Thursday with Age of Ultron, <laughs> except me, um, taking into account that the premiere is on Monday. How could it be that you're going to watch it so ahead of its time? In time? Uh, is it usual? Is it a usual custom? Sorry, which happens with other movies, or have you obtained such privilege else? How? Thanks and hail the sweaty nerds. Yeah, on Thursday we had a chance. At least a number of us had a chance to yeah, go and watch go. Avengers: Age of Ultron. But this is basically how this works. Okay, so what happens is it is standard practice that the first press screenings usually happen before the premiere. That's what happens. The studios want to make sure that the film journalists, the people who have audiences of their own, see the movie so that they're able and they're equipped to talk about these films. And hopefully, if they like the films, start buzzing about them and start getting the energy level up for them and get people excited about the movies. That's their hope if the movies are any good. It's always a big red flag when a studio does not have press screenings in advance. It's like, oh, so clearly the studio has no faith in this movie. Uh, but for the most part, that's what happens. So Disney has, you know, the, the premiere is, is on Monday. So they wanted the first the press to see it first, and they put it out so they have these press screenings. And we happen to be on the press list. Then everyone wants to ask me. I get so many emails. I get so many emails. John, who do I write to to get put on the press list? You don't get put on a press list. They'll, they'll get in touch with you. If they think you have an audience and stuff like that, they'll get in touch with you and put you on. There's nowhere you write to. There's no magic button you push um, to be able to get put on the press list. So once you're on that list and they know you, then they reach out to you and they reach out to a bunch of us and said, hey, come on down, see this movie, uh, or please come see this movie. And uh, hopefully we like it and we'll be able to buzz about it. And if we don't like it, then we let people know it's not any good. But that's generally the way it kind of goes. Mm, the flip side as well is if you work in the industry, so for a journalist, uh, you'll get invited to the press screening just for the purpose so, uh, that you've seen the movie before you go and interview the cast. So, yes. and then that's, and then uh, as the um, release date's lifted, then obviously you can put out those interviews that you've had with the celebrity and, again, create that buzz. Yeah. Uh, but I've only ever really gone through a professional side because I'd be interviewing the cast next. So when I'm watching these movies, I'm taking notes. You know, it's not like, yay, that was fun. It's 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 work. I never take notes. I just go, yay, it's fun. Actually, well, the funny thing was was that yesterday on Friday, I had to go in, to, to Maud's point, I went and I interviewed Robert Downey Jr., Chris Evans, Chris Hemsworth, Scarlett Johansson, uh, you know, the whole cast. But for me to be able to do that, you got to see the movie first. Mm -hmm. So you have some intelligent questions to ask them. So they make sure you've seen the movie first. And that's what this screening was. Yeah. Well, if you're going to talk about the movie, it's good to see the movie. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. 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 I've tried to wing it before. <laughs> Actually, it's kind of funny because I'm doing the red carpet on Monday. Yes, that's right. But you haven't seen the movie, but you still got to do the red carpet. Yeah. You'll do great. Yeah. You'll do great. Yeah. Precious writes, recently it was reportedly announced by The Hollywood Reporter that the CEO of Reflective Media, Ryan Kavanagh, stated that there would be a... I think they probably meant Relativity Media, but yeah. Oh, okay. Relativity Media, Ryan Kavanagh, stated that there would be a sequel to Immortals, which would star your little favourite guy, Henry Cavill, again. I would personally be very excited by a sequel as I loved the first movie. I know some of you were not so too impressed by the first, but do you think that there's any point to a sequel as spoilers Henry Cav uh, Henry's character dies at the end would Henry really return especially as he's now um, as he now has success with Superman and Warner Brothers along with his upcoming movies or do you think he was signed to multiple movies well here's the thing uh, look whenever a studio has a movie coming out and they think there's even the remotest possibility that even maybe sometime in the future we might want to turn this into a franchise we might want to do a sequel they will get these actors to sign multiple film deals. Now, once again, that does not mean, just because an actor signs a multiple film deal, like all these people got excited to say, John, um, hey, uh, fact checker Ray, who's the dude who played, um, who played uh, uh, Sebastian Stan, I answered my own questions, played Winter Soldier. <laughs> yes. um, so, so people say, well, John, we know he's going to become the Captain America because they signed him to a seven film deal. That's irrelevant. You know who else signed like a four, four film deal? Hugo Weaving. Hugo Weaving signed a four film deal to play Red Skull. And guess what? He ain't going to be in four films. All signing a multiple film deal does, and we, we explain this a lot, but it comes up a lot, is that 
if the studio decides they want to do something more with that actor as that character in one of their movies, then that actor is now obligated to come back and return in that role. It does not obligate the studio to use them. For example, um, Dennis or Fact Checker Ray, uh, who's the star of Empire? Terrence Howard was playing Rhodey in the first Iron Man, right? Had a multiple film deal. Marvel decided they wanted to go with Don Cheadle. They decided to change. But, but, but he had a multiple film deal. Yeah, that just means he's obligated to be in the movie if Marvel says we want you in the movie. It does not obligate Marvel to put him in. All the multiple film deal stuff does is it just gives the studio some security and gives them flexibility because they don't have to worry about whether we can get that actor to come back and play the role because we got him under a four film deal or a seven film deal or whatever or what have you. Apparently, uh, Relatively Media had the foresight with Immortals that they signed this still at the time relatively unknown actor Henry Cavill to, to a multiple film deal. And maybe now, like you mentioned, he's kind of big now. He's Superman. He's got Man From U.N.C.L.E. coming out. He's got a bunch of different stuff on, on the works. Maybe he'll be the new James Bond. This actually makes it a great time. I'm positive that has something to do with Relativity going, hey, maybe we should make an Immortals too, <laughs> since Henry Cavill is such a big deal now. And, you know, it's about, it's about Greek mythology, man. Just because a guy dies in one movie doesn't mean that the gods can't decide we need this hero back on <laughs> Earth and send him back. I mean, and look, I actually didn't mind Immortals. I actually had a pretty good time with it. Unfortunately, the absolute worst part of that movie was Mickey Rourke. He was terrible in that movie. Um, he just kind of slept walked through that whole thing for the paycheck. But anyway, um, yes, uh, I do believe that he's coming back. This is a good time to do another one. I think it could be a little bit more successful than the first one. They're capitalizing on the popularity of the lead actor right now. And yeah, I have no doubt that the way they're able to get Henry right now in the midst of his success and all of his busy schedule is that they did indeed probably have a multi-film deal on, their, on that. And so he's obligated to return. For those that don't know, The Immortals was out in 2011. Uh, it starred not only Henry Cavill, but also Mickey Rourke, Stephen Dorff, Frida Pinto, Luke Evans, John Hurt. So that's uh, like big names. Frida in it. Pinto. She's gorgeous. Isn't She's she? so beautiful. Stunning. Um, now, the problem though is that on IMDb, it got a 6.1 out of 10 rating. Metascore gave it 46 out of 100, and Metacritic gave it 23. So it didn't actually rate very well. I've noticed, especially in the last couple of years now, that superhero movies have taken the forefront, that sword and sandal movies haven't been going so well. Two Hercules uh, didn't actually do great things in the box office. If Dwayne The Rock Johnson can't pull in huge dollars uh, in a tiny little leather thong, then who can? Uh, do you think that if The Immortals 2 came back, are we in a place... Uh, popularity-wise, to see a sword and sandal movie. Yes. Ooh. The problem with the Hercules movies, of course, was that everybody from 10 miles away saw that those movies looked awful. Oh. They looked terrible. I mean, they, there was nothing redeeming about them. I mean, I went to go see the one with The Rock simply because The Rock was in it. And, you know, he he's so charming and charismatic, he almost made that movie watchable. But even he, with that big billion-dollar smile and all that That's kind of what stuff. That's was off-putting. He's in Greek mythology times. It's oh, like, there is no toothbrush, but his teeth are oh, glowing. That smile, man. I mean, even the billion-dollar smile couldn't bring people in. I mean, everybody just smelled that one from 10 miles away. So that was unfortunate. But I do believe you, you put out a good sword and sandal movie. I believe there will, people, there will be an audience there to see it. And, you know, you put in Superman into that. It could add to the allure. Mm -hmm. Dazza Blast writes, watched the show the other day where you came up with the top five films for the 2015 box office, and I agree that the films picked could make that much. But one film that I think will make a big surprise hit that could make a billion is the Minions movie. Everyone likes these characters, plus kids will want to see it over and over. And I think it's the only film out that time for kids. Do you think Minions could make a billion? Um, you're right. I should have had Minions on my list. Before everybody guffaws at that, like you, maybe you heard this email and this, oh, come on, Minions make a billion? You know what this Despicable Me 2 made? Nine, uh, 970 million. What? It was 0.3 off from a billion. Wow. That's how much money that movie made. And I think a Minions will make more. I think millions, uh, Minions will join the Billion Dollar Club. And I think I made a mistake in not having Minions on my list. I think you raise a terrific point. And you're right. I looked at its re release schedule. It's got a friendly release schedule. People are just enamored with the Minions for good reason. The first trailer they put out was killer. 
That first Minions trailer was amazing. They got to start airing that one again. Um, and you know what? So yeah, that this, Minions is going to make over a billion and it will be in the top five. I should have had it on my list. I know that Despicable Me 1 and 2 focused on the relationship of Gru, the stepfather, to three young girls. Yes. But obviously the big stars were the Minions. Do you think that they've kind of used those two as a platform to create what really essentially is going to be the marketing golden carrot? I golden think, carrot? Golden egg. Goose, I eggs, think dangling carrot. The Minions to the studio were a very pleasant surprise. Oops. Uh-huh. I don't think they realized how big those characters were going to go over when they made the first Despicable Me. I think they, they had, they had their, these are nice, these are cute, these are going to sell some toys, some people are going to like. I don't think they understood at the time how beloved they would be and how much people would just attach to them. And I think they got a glimpse of that, and so they increased their role a little bit for the second Minions movie, or for the second Despicable Me. See, I'm even calling it a Minions movie. Mm. The second Despicable Me movie, <clears throat> and now we're going to the standalone Minions. Yeah, man, this thing could do a lot of damage at the box office. I think you're right. It's going to be interesting to sit back and see how well it does. I just want a, one of those buttons where it does all the sound effects for the minions. <laughs> oh, no, Why would like I need jawa. one of those when I have you? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that is actually all the questions that we have for Mailbag today. Thank you so much, John, for answering those questions. Don't forget, if you want to email in your question, you can. Just email through to amcmovietalk at gmail.com. If you want an audio version of this show, check out that link in the description because you can find the audio version right there. If you do want to see a movie this weekend, well, that's a pretty cool thing because movies rock. Jump onto amctheaters.com to check out your local cinemas, times, and what's playing. Guys in the room, Ray, thank you so much. And also, hey there. Hold on, what's the hashtag again? (laughs) Uh, Damn it, Dennis. Damn it, Dennis. (laughs) Hashtag damn it, Dennis. Never let that die. Uh, Thank you for making this show possible. And John, where can people find you if they want to chat movies? You can follow me on the Facebooks and the Twitters by following me just simply at John Campia. And while I've got you, quickly like this video if you did like it and subscribe to the channel if you have not yet. My name's Maud Garrett. You can get me on uh, Twitter and Instagram, even Facebook if you search Maud Garrett. Thank you so much for watching the show.